Welcome to the heart of the world's most dangerous workplace, where the roar of the engines and the bustle of the crew never cease. This is the flight deck of a U.S. aircraft carrier, where adrenaline and danger go hand in hand. The crew works tirelessly to ensure the safe takeoff and landing of each aircraft, all while navigating the limited space and deafening noise. One careless moment could mean disaster, as the sheer power of a jet engine could suck a crew member in or blast them off the edge of the deck into the unforgiving ocean below. But with the best of the best at the helm and cutting-edge technology at their disposal, these brave men and women continue to conquer the impossible. These marvels of modern engineering are home to over 5,000 personnel, each playing a vital role in maintaining the carrier's dominance in the skies and on the seas. Step onto the flight deck, the beating heart of the carrier, where a choreographed ballet of humans and machines unfolds. What happens on the flight deck when a plane takes off and lands? First up, a team of skilled sailors arm the aircraft, ready to tackle the critical task of cleaning the front and side windows. Working alongside the pilot, they meticulously scrub away dirt and grime that could obstruct their view and jeopardize the success of the mission. But that's just the beginning. While the window cleaning crew works their magic, another group of sailors takes charge of guiding the pilot to the precise takeoff position on the deck. The sailors responsible for directing the pilot are known as the Shooter and Yellow Shirt. The Shooter, also called a Catapult Officer, oversees the catapult system that launches the aircraft, while a Yellow Shirt is responsible for the safe movement of aircraft on the flight deck. To prepare for a takeoff, the flight deck crew moves the aircraft into position at the rear of the catapult and attaches the tow bar on the aircraft nose gear on the front wheels to a slot in the shuttle. The crew positions another bar, the hold back between the back of the wheel and the shuttle. In an F-14 and F-A-18 fighter jet, the hold back is built into the nose gear. In other aircraft, it's a separate piece. While all of this is going on, the flight crew raises the jet blast deflector behind the aircraft. When the JBD, tow bar, and holdback are all in position and all the final checks have been made, the catapult officer, also known as the shooter, gets the catapults ready from the catapult control pod, a small encased control station with a transparent dome that protrudes above the flight deck. As the pilot prepares for takeoff, the final checkers approach the aircraft using a series of hand signals to communicate with the pilot. The first checker, stationed near the nose, signals the pilot to turn off the engines and release the brakes. Meanwhile, the second checker, located near the tail, inspects the underside of the aircraft to ensure that there are no obstructions or hazards that could jeopardize the launch. Once the second checker gives the all-clear signal, the first checker signals the pilot to restart the engines and prepare for launch. As the aircraft gains speed and prepares to lift off the deck, the first checker uses hand signals to communicate with the pilot indicating whether or not the aircraft is properly aligned for takeoff. When the aircraft is ready to go, the catapult officer opens valves to fill the catapult cylinders with high-pressure steam from the ship's reactors. The steam provides the necessary force to propel the pistons at high speed, slinging the aircraft forward to generate the necessary lift for takeoff. Initially, the pistons are locked into place, so the cylinders simply build up pressure. The catapult officer carefully monitors the pressure level so it's just right for the particular aircraft and deck conditions. If the pressure is too low, the aircraft won't get moving fast enough to take off and the catapult will throw it into the ocean. If there's too much pressure, the sudden jerk could break the nose gear right off. When the cylinders are charged to the appropriate pressure level, the pilot blasts the aircraft's engines. The holdback keeps the aircraft on the shuttle while the engines generate considerable thrust. The catapult officer releases the pistons. The force causes the holdbacks to release, and the steam pressure slams the shuttle and the aircraft forward. At the end of the catapult, the tow bar pops out of the shuttle, releasing the aircraft. This totally steam-driven system can rocket a 45,000-pound aircraft from 0 to 165 miles an hour in just two seconds. If everything goes well, the speeding aircraft has generated enough lift to take off. If not, the pilot activate their ejector seats to escape before the aircraft goes hurtling into the ocean ahead of the ship. This hardly ever happens, but the risk is always there. Taking off is extremely difficult, but the real trick is coming back in. 
Landing on a flight deck is one of the most difficult things a Navy pilot will ever do. The flight deck only has about 500 feet of runway space for landing aircraft, which isn't nearly enough for the heavy high-speed jets on U.S. carriers. To land on the flight deck, each aircraft needs a tail hook, which is exactly what it sounds like, an extended hook attached to the aircraft's tail. The pilot's goal is to snag the tail hook on one of the four arresting wires, sturdy cables woven from high tensile steel wire. The arresting wires are stretched across the deck and are attached on both ends to hydraulic cylinders below deck. If the tail hook snags an arresting wire, it pulls the wire out and a hydraulic cylinder system absorbs the energy to bring the aircraft to a stop. The arresting wire system can stop a 54,000 pound aircraft traveling 150 miles per hour in only two seconds in a 315 foot landing area. There are four parallel arresting wires, spaced about 50 feet apart, to expand the target area for the pilot. Pilots are aiming for the third wire, as it's the safest and most effective target. They never shoot for the first wire because it's dangerously close to the edge of the deck. If they come in too low on the first wire, they could easily crash into the stern of the ship. It's acceptable to snag the second or fourth wire, but for a pilot to move up through the ranks, he or she has to be able to catch the third wire consistently. To pull off this incredible trick, the pilot needs to approach the deck at exactly the right angle. The landing procedure starts when the various returning aircraft stack up in a huge oval flying pattern near the carrier. The Carrier Air Traffic Control Center below deck decides the landing order of the waiting aircraft based on the various fuel levels. An aircraft that's about to run out of fuel comes down before one that can keep flying for a while. When it's time for the aircraft to land, a pilot breaks free of this landing pattern and heads toward the stern of the ship. The landing signal officer helps guide the aircraft in through radio communications as well as a collection of lights on the deck. If the aircraft is off course, the LSOs can use radio commands or illuminate other lights to correct him or her or to wave them off, send them around for another attempt. In addition to the LSOs, pilots look to the Fresnel Lens Optical Landing System, commonly referred to as the lens for landing guidance. The lens consists of a series of lights and Fresnel lenses mounted to a gyroscopically stabilized platform. The lens focuses the light into the narrow beams that are directed into the sky at various angles. The pilot will see different lights depending on the aircraft's angle of approach. If the aircraft is right on target, the pilot will see an amber light dubbed the meatball in line with a row of green lights. If the amber light appears above the green lights, the aircraft is coming in too high. If the amber light appears below the green lights, the aircraft is coming in too low. If the aircraft is coming in way too low, the pilot will see red lights. As soon as the aircraft hits the deck, the pilot will push the engines to full power instead of slowing down to bring the aircraft to a stop. This may seem counterintuitive, but if the tail hook doesn't catch any of the resting wires, the aircraft needs to be moving fast enough to take off again and come around for another pass. The landing runway is tilted at a 14 degree angle to the rest of the ship so bolters like this can take off from the side of the ship instead of plowing into the aircraft on the other end of the deck. As soon as an aircraft lands, it's pulled out of the landing strip and chained down on the side of the flight deck. Inactive aircraft are always tightly secured to keep them from sliding around as the deck rocks back and forth. The flight deck crew has to be prepared for a wide range of unexpected events, including raging aircraft fires. During takeoff or recovery operations, they have plenty of safety equipment at the ready. Among other things, the flight deck has a small fire truck and nozzles leading to water tanks and aqueous film foaming foam and advanced fire extinguishing material. There are also nozzles for jet fuel and a number of other useful liquids. Flight deck personnel also face the risk of a jet engine blowing them overboard. Safety nets around the side of the flight deck offer some protection, but for extra safety, Personnel are also equipped with float coats, self-inflating jackets with flashing distress lights that are activated with contact with water. Flight deck personnel also wear heavy-duty helmets called cranials which protect their head and their hearing. The flight deck crew is also responsible for the recovery of aircraft that have completed their missions. This involves catching the aircraft as they land on the deck, using a system of cables and hooks to slow them down and bring them to a stop. This is known as an arrested landing, and it's one of the most challenging maneuvers that a pilot can perform. It requires incredible skill and precision, as the pilot must land the aircraft in just the right spot on the deck and at just the right speed to ensure a safe landing. 
Once the aircraft is safely on the deck, the flight deck crew goes to work once again. They'll secure the aircraft to the deck, refuel it, and perform any necessary maintenance or repairs. Then, the process starts all over again as the crew prepares the aircraft for its next mission. The aircraft carrier's flight deck is a constantly busy and demanding place, with aircraft taking off and landing around the clock. It requires discipline, teamwork, and a commitment to excellence from everyone involved. But despite the challenges, it's also a place of excitement and pride, as the sailors who work there know that they're part of a team that's at the forefront of naval aviation. In the end, it's the teamwork and the dedication of everyone on the aircraft carrier that makes it possible for aircraft to take off and complete their missions. It's a testament to the skill, bravery, and professionalism of the men and women of the United States Navy. And that wraps up our journey through this incredible world of U.S. aircraft carriers and the brave men and women who work tirelessly to keep them operational. If you enjoyed this video, please don't forget to hit that like button and subscribe to our channel for more fascinating content. We'd love to hear your thoughts on today's topic. What do you find most impressive about aircraft carriers and their crews? Share your thoughts in the comments below, and if you have the utmost respect for the US Navy, leave a blue heart to show your appreciation. Thanks for watching. See you next time.